Hello and welcome to a new video. Today I am sharing with you the books that I read in 2020. I read 24 books last year and some of them, most of them, I read as physical books. I have some of them here with me. Others were lent, taken out of libraries, given back to their owners. I lent it to other people and the rest I read through audiobooks. And as I have 24 books. I am trying to stick to two minutes or less on each book because I don't want to make a three hour video. So let's get started. I'm going to be sharing them in the order that I read them, not in the order that I like them the most. Actually, some of the ones that I like the most are the ones that I read towards the end of the year. But I will mention that when I share the books and I'm also sharing a bookshop link where I'm sharing all the names and authors for each of the books in order that, you know, you don't need to be journaling and rushing to get the names of the books. All of them, you can find them on this link that is on this video's description. So let's get started. So the first book that I read in 2022 was Mycophilia Revelations from the Weird World of Mushrooms by author Eugenia Bone. This is the second book that I've read by Eugenia Bone. The first one was Microbia and I really enjoyed Mycophilia. I recommend this book for anyone that is looking to learn and read about mushrooms in a very chill way. Um, Eugenia does this book pretty much like a memoir through her journey on diving into all things fungi across fields. So it's great to learn in a chill way about mushrooms from a gastronomical point of view, environmental point of view, medicinal mushrooms, um, the role that they play in PTSD. She shares a lot about the mushroom scene in the United States, like the turtle and all those good things. And you know, it's funny in parts, it's very anecdotal in other parts, and it's also a great resource to learn about the weird world of mushrooms. You can actually also learn how to grow some of them in Eugenia's bone. I really loved it. And that was my first read for 2022. My second read of 2022 was Confieso que he vivido. I confess that I've lived the autobiography by Pablo Neruda, the Chilean poet and diplomat. I loved this autobiography. I hadn't read autobiographies in a very long time and I loved it because Pablo's way of writing, Pablo's way of writing and introducing characters and describing scenes is so tangible you feel you're there with him and you fall in love with the places and the people that he's sharing about it's poetic it's adventurous it's a very wild life that he had it's all of his adventures through you know being nobody and trying to make it as an artist and um moving around the globe getting this opportunity to be a diplomat for some random reason and just you know having so many adventures it's such a great book i felt that the feeling that i had while reading it is it really inspired me to be more adventurous in my life you also get a lot of the sense of his poems all the you know all the artists he meets in different points of his life and also people in the political world, around the world, not only in Chile. And I also love how Paolo really combines his own personal story with everything going on in the so social, political and economic scenarios around him and within him because he ends uh, participating in a lot of politics and whatnot. But I truly enjoy this book and it really showed me how much I can learn and how enjoyable autobiographies are for me. The third book that I read last year was Active Hope, How to Face the Mess We Are In with Unexpected Resilience and Creative Power, written by Joanna Macy and Chris Johnstone. This was my first audiobook of the year and at this point, it was around March, I I found myself in a state of eco-anxiety. I was very depressed with the 
current situation of our world and you know how we are depleting natural resources and we actually had a massive drop of petroleum in the sea in Peru and I was really devastated for a couple of weeks. I couldn't even start working. I would just sit down to paint and just cry. But anyhow, I this book came in the right time. My friends from the Zero Waste School Permacrafters, they recommended this book to me. So I, I listened to the audiobook and I feel it was a, an amazing resource to pretty much learn what is our position in the current situation of the world, of the natural world, of the depletion of the world, how not to lose hope and how to, you know, go from, I feel there are two positions. One of them is I'm so little, my own change won't really change anything. And the other one is we are, you know, so deep in the mud that there's no way this will change. So I won't do anything. And I love how this book is a beautiful um, opportunity and invitation for us to realize that each of us has such a big power in uplifting each other up, in uplifting ourselves and in truly facing these with active hope, as the title says. I love how it's an invitation not only to be, you know, daydreamers and believe that everything is going to change, but actually how to take physical actions in order to to stay resilient through through the period that we're living and it's a beautiful resource I recommend it for anyone that is all things nature and loves nature and sometimes gets overwhelmed or angry or depressed due to you know feeling that our world is being burned down and yeah the next book that I read was The Most Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Possible by Charles Eisenstein. This is the first book that I read by Charles Eisenstein and I loved reading this book. Then again, continuing with the eco-anxiety and heartfelt love for our planet, preoccupation with the state of the world and the depletion of natural resources. And I feel that what I really like this book and what really made it different than Active Hope for me is I feel this book really made me remember that I am not alone, that there's a lot of people around the globe who truly believe there is a better way to live in this world. Um, I feel there's a lot of us who really connect to the idea that there is a way in the one things could work in the world where we can all remember we are all interconnected and remember that there are ways that we can live that are uplifting for human beings but are also living, respecting and working in unity with every other single living species in the planet, with plants, animals, fungi, lands. Um, and I love that this book for me was a very practical resource from the world we're in and this idea of we can live in a world that we are not trashing everything and everything is, you know, working in, in what is the word? Everything is working together, like there's no waste, everything is used um, and there's no actual end to that and we are all working in unity. I. I feel I'm lacking words today, but I love that this book felt like the bridge from going in between our current world, which already has a lot of amazing things and um, the world that we dream, that we know that could exist with all of us in unity. So I feel this book is like that bridge in between one world and the other. And it also reminded me so much about how beautiful life is here today and how beautiful is it is to enjoy it. I feel that sometimes I felt super guilty about um, my way of living and not that I don't think it's beautiful to make changes, of course, but also remember that, you know, um, being a human being, I'm going to have a footprint of some sort and that that is okay and making peace with that has definitely been very good for my, my mental health. And I truly believe that this book was a helpful resource in order to make pieces with that. So before I keep sharing about the books that I read this year, let me share with you a little bit about today's video sponsor, who is Squarespace. I've been using Squarespace since 2018 
They are the home for my domain, my website, my online portfolio, and my online shop as well as my email campaigns, and I couldn't recommend them enough. Something that I love about Squarespace is how beautiful they make my artwork look on desktop and mobile with their automatic image scaling. I also love how easy it is to showcase my art in beautiful ways with their award-winning portfolio designs. And a feature that I've been loving lately is their password protected sites that I can share with specific clients. If you want to check out Squarespace, go to the first link in this video's description. We're giving you two weeks for free and then you can use the code Caro Arevalo to get 10% of your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you so much Squarespace and now let me keep talking about books. The next book that I read, this was actually a book that I reread this year. I read it for the first time maybe in 2017 and it's The Mission of Art by Alex Gray. Oh my god I just found some money. I reread this book because I feel it's so full of knowledge and sometimes I read, I love something and then I forget everything that I read. So I wanted to reread it with a little bit more intention and a little bit more presence. And what I loved about The Mission of Art is I feel it's books within books. Alex, the author, goes into a lot of the history of art. He really dives deep into the rabbit hole of art history. If you want to learn more about art, art history, this is a beautiful book for it because I love that his perspective throughout art history is all the great artists and their connection to source, their connection to the universe, to spirit, to creativity. And I also say that it is a book within books because it's not only a lesson about art history, but Alex really dives deep into what is the connection in between ourselves, the artist and the creative muse. What is our connection with creativity itself? How are we showing up to pursue our art and be masters of our craft and show up vulnerable and open and ready to co-create with the universe? I feel this book was a beautiful invitation for me to dive deeper into what it means to make art as a spiritual practice and all the power that creating actually has for all of us, no matter if we are pursuing a career in the art field or if we, you know, just want to paint once a year or if our art, our, <laughs> or if our craft it's not painting and it can be decorating or baking or fixing cars or whatever it is. It's a beautiful invitation to see our crafts as a practice with, as a spiritual practice and as a means to connect deeper to spirit, to the universe, to this beautiful planet that we're living in. The next book that I read was an audiobook called In Search of Mycotopia. Citizen Science, Fungi Fanatics, and the Untapped Potential of Mushrooms, written by Doug Behrendt. I feel this book was a beautiful invitation to see the world as a place where humans are not in charge and really dive deep into what is the role that the fungi have, not only for human health, but for the health of the whole planet. It reminded me a little of how I felt when reading Mycophilia, as you know, Doug also shares um, a memoir and going to all the mushroom festivals and talking about the mushroom scene. And I feel that it was also beautiful because this book is newer and it's showing all the advances that have been made with fungi and fungi in community with humans. He touches base on mycelium being used as eco-materials in order to create bricks or make fashion accessories. And it's just a beautiful book if you're diving your feet in the fungi world and want to learn more about fungi across fields, especially in the field of nature. I have to say my favorite ever fungi book is Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake. This one is not in this video because this one I read when it came out in 2020, 
And it's not only my favorite book on fungi, but it's also one of my favorite books ever. It's one of those books that you read and after a time, maybe like after half a chapter, you just need to close it, integrate everything and all the rich information you just learned, and then you go back to reading. I cannot recommend that book enough. And I also love Doug's book, so. I pretty much love all fungi books. And continuing with the fungi, the next book that I read was by Keith Seifert, The Hidden, the Hidden Kingdom of Fungi, exploring the microscopic world in our forests, homes, and bodies. This one is by Keith Seifert. And I actually got this book specifically for research doing my fungi painting it was very easy <laughs> you must already be so bored to hearing about this but it was very easy to find information and photographs and research about mushrooms which are the fruiting body of fungi but it was very challenging to find information on some microscopic fungi because it's the least researched part of the fungi kingdom and as this book talks specifically about the microscopic world of fungi, I thought it could be of help in order to help complete my painting. It did help me a little, but more than anything, it was such a different fungi read from all the other ones that I've made because it's specifically talking about the microscopic fungi, a lot of fungi that live within our human body and a lot of the microscopic ones that we are not seeing that are doing all the work um, within soil, within the water, within the air, within even outer space. So it was just a beautiful read in order to understand more of the unseen world that fungi have. So if you are a fungi nerd and want to learn more about the least talked and the least researched side of this amazing weird kingdom, this is your book. The eighth book that I read this year was Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert, and these I read in the format of an audiobook. I truly love this book because Elizabeth goes deep onto what is our relationship with creativity and what is our relationship with a creative muse. Elizabeth sees us as half of the relationship and the creative muse as the other half. I love how she touches base on the creative idea is something that comes, knocks our door, sees if we're ready and willing to show up and then pretty much possess us and we work in a relationship. And this is something that I believe as a creator, I feel that the ideas are not only coming from me, but are coming from a connection and a com communication with the outer world, with the universe, with the spirit. And that's why I always talk about creativity as a spiritual practice. And I loved how this book touched base on if creativity is a spirit, spirit doesn't have a body. So we have bodies and these ideas are floating around. And when they see someone who is showing up and ready to get to work, then they'll come and they'll see if we are ready to play with this specific book idea or painting or song. And if they see that we are constantly showing up, then they'll stay and play with us and we'll co-create this. But then if we are stuck in the fear, and that's a very big topic on the book, she touches base on the creative blog being our worst enemy and how we can become our worst enemy by feeding that fearful side of ourselves. So it's a beautiful conversation on creativity and the relationship that we have to it. She also shares a bunch of personal stories about ideas that left her because she was not really showing up to put the work and make the idea happen. So great book for all things creativity, relationship with the creative muse and creative blockage. My next read was Who Ordered This Truckload of Dung by Monk Ajahn Bram. And this was one of my favorite books of the year. It was recommended by one of our good friends by Javier. This is Javier's favorite book and he had an extra copy. So it was a gift and I love it. It's around a hundred short stories on 
learning how to navigate the challenges and the difficult times in life. I loved it because they are super short. It's not that you need to read the whole book at once. You can literally open any page and just read one of the short stories each night or however you please. But I love them because the stories really reminded me not only how to navigate life's most challenging times with endurance and persistence and positivity, but I love that the book itself is written in such a way that it invites in a lot of lightness, a lot of calm, and it really makes you laugh along the way. The way that he writes is super positive and super just light, you know, it's like not like heavy loads. And I think that sometimes when we're thinking about the healing journey, at least for me, I can go very deep and we need to see the darkness and the shadow and it gets very emo, which is also valid and it's part of it for sure. There's definitely the ugly parts of a healing journey, but I love this book that really touches base on how we can make a lot of massive change from positivity and from loving more. Yeah, just by loving more. The next book that I read was Walking Through Walls, a memoir by Marina Abramovich. I had this one as an audiobook. My friend Gabby recommended this book and I am so thankful for Gabby because I loved reading Marina's autobiography. Um, Marina shares her story since being a kid growing up and all the way up until the moment she released the book. I love it because she had a very hard life and any challenge that life put her way, she really showed up for it. And the book tells the story of how she overcome all of life challenges and difficulties throughout the years. It's a beautiful insight into her life adventure as a human, as a lover, as an artist. And I love to learn more about her creative process. I don't do performance art and performance art has always really been very attractive to me. And I love learning from Marina's perspective. She's always been a performer and this type of art has been ridiculed and has been looked down by a lot of the art scene and the art folks around the world. Not that any of that is important, but it's beautiful to see Marina's endurance and Marina's really, you know, she knew why she was doing everything that she created. So learning her process and everything that goes behind each of her pieces, why everything is there because everything has a reason. And at the same time, how the critique would just go in one ear out the other and how within time they ended up loving Marina's work. And I loved how she shares learning from different spiritual teachers throughout her life and from just teachers in any scenario and throughout all the challenges. And it was just a very raw and refreshing book. I felt she really shared everything and she was not trying to portray herself one way or the other. She was just being herself while sharing her autobiography. And I loved this book. I enjoyed so much that the audiobook was read by her that made it even more magical. And I'm glad that I listened to it because I loved listening to her words and seeing her voice change when she would share different parts of her artistic or her love story or her spiritual journey. Her journey with creativity is so magical. I, I loved this book and I've talked more than two minutes about this one. <laughs> the next book that I read, I don't have it because I took it out from the library, but it was The Hidden Half of Nature, The Microbial Roots of Life and Death, written by David Montgomery and Anne Bickle. This book was all about regenerative culture and it really goes deep into soil. The book starts with the authors who are a partnership, who are um, married, I believe, and they buy a house and they realize that their backyard soil is depleted. It doesn't work. It's pretty much just like dead sand. And it's the whole journey of both of them trying to bring back the 
soil to life. And the book starts there, but then it goes really deep into regenerative agriculture as well as health. It really opened up my eyes. I haven't read a lot of books about soil. I've read about fungi a lot, but I loved learning the deep importance that our soil has for our health, not only human health, but all living beings health. It's a beautiful eye opener to you know, all the microbial beings that make up soil, all the minerals that make up soil, all the richness and life that is needed in order to create and sustain rich soil and the deep importance that the soil has in order for our crops to be as rich as they are. Um, definitely a carrot is not the same in a very rich, organic, free of pesticide with real seeds soil than a GMO carrot grown, you know, without rich soil and just put a lot of chemicals in order to make it look more orange and beautiful. The amount of nutrients that we get are so different only because of soil, of course, because of a lot of other reasons like the quality of water and the air and the pesticides and the seeds. But this book really touches base on the importance of soil and I really appreciate because it also goes deep into how the type of soil that grows and that we take care of in our communities affect everything within the community, not only the type of food that people eat, but you know, the levels of education that we can get. And it just goes down the rabbit hole of how everything is connected. And, in, and it starts with something that sometimes we see as simple or as not important as soil. I now have deep respect for soil. I love reading books that are about one specific topic. Last year, two years ago, 2021, I read um, Gathering Moss by Robin Wall Kimmer. The whole book is about moss. And now I have such a deep reverence for moss that I didn't have before because I truly didn't understand the amazing role that they've played in the evolution of our planet and within our lives. So highly recommend this one if you haven't read a lot about soil and are, are, and are interested. I also loved the documentary Kiss the Ground which we watched a few years back and also goes deep down in regenerative agriculture and the importance of soil. The next book that I read was Walking One Step at a Time by author Erling Cage. I love this book. I love the format. I love the photograph in the caratula. I don't know that word in English right now, but the author goes into how a simple act like walking can really change everything. It can really change our perspective on how we live our lives, on how we get to know a new place that we visit, and how it can really change not only our perspective because of the act of walking, but also the literal perspective from where we are seeing everything. And when we walk, of course, we are paying attention to way more detail than when we are either driving or flying or just taking the subway. Um, he really goes down the rabbit hole of sharing a lot about his walk. The author was actually the first person to ever reach the North Pole, the South Pole and the summit of the Mount Everest on foot. So you can imagine all the stories that he has to share about why he walks and why this is such a pleasurable practice. I loved this book because it starts with walking, but it's not only about the physical act of walking, but everything that it entangles. And, you know, the most metaphorical way of saying go one step at a time, that theme is definitely rooted within the whole book. So it's a lot about literally learning how to go slower within our life and how, you know, walking and going by foot is not only totally fine, but it's an amazing, beautiful experience. So this book really brought a lot of joy to me in just learning about people that are really going slow and taking it as they want, because that's the way they approach life. And it it's just super inspiring. <laughs> The next book that I read was Sana tu cuerpo de la A a la Z by Louise Hay. 
Heal Your Body from A to Z by Louise Hay. The Mental Causes of Physical Illness and the Way to Overcome Them. This was a very simple and easy to read book, yet very knowledgeable and wonderful. It's pretty much an ABC from different illnesses. And I don't know if you can see. It is pretty much an ABC from illnesses in alphabetical order and pretty much what could be the emotional happening behind it. And it also has a series of recommendations of ways to overcome them. I think it's a beautiful perspective to consider. Um, the author is pretty much inviting us to the understanding that any physical illness that our body is manifesting is a reflection from something going in our inner world, something coming from our emotions or from past trauma. And it's a beautiful invitation to start seeing them related and not as something separate. Um, it's an invitation to see how there is a conversation going on in between our emotions and our physical reactions, like one is mirroring the other. And, you know, I think it's a beautiful invitation to just learn from a different perspective. Louise Hayes has so many amazing books and it's such a knowledgeable author that I really respect a lot of her work. And this book was beautiful to just take a deeper um, look into problems um, related to our physical body, the relationship to our emotions, and also how can we give a pause and for a little while look within and see if there's anything there that might need our attention. Then I read Violeta by Isabel Allende. This book came out in 2022 and I hadn't read Isabel Allende in the longest time. This book is a novel and it tells the story of Violeta del Valle who lives around a hundred years and lives through, through two world pandemics and pretty much narrates the story of this magical woman living through a lot of roller coasters that happened in the 20th century. And I love this book. I love not only the story of Violeta del Valle and all the characters around her. I believe this may have been the first book that I finished this year that made me cry. Uh, when I read a book that is telling the story of someone and I feel they become my friend. You know, they are opening their story to me throughout the book. I have a hard time parting ways because I'm going to cry. <laughs> because I just made a new friend and I just met this whole new universe. And then when you finish the book, it's like, now we need to part ways and say goodbye. But um, this book has a lot of history and it also has a lot of magical realism. Magical realism may be my favorite um, type of writing, my favorite type of books, and Isabel Allende is one of the masters of magical realism. I loved reading Violeta, not only because of the story itself, but also it reminded me my passion for Isabel Allende's writing. I've read maybe like six of her books and after this, I just remembered how much I love Isabel and in a few minutes, I'll share some other Isabel book that I ended up reading this year, but highly recommend Violeta. Isabel is as amazing as she's been through all of her books. And the only reason why I haven't read more of Isabel after Violeta is because when I was obsessed with Isabel Allende like 15 years ago, I read five books at the same time and then now they're all mixed up on my brain so I'm trying to take my time in order not to then mix them up but highly recommend these if you're into novels if you love magical realism this is a beautiful one and if you don't know magical realism please look it up it's one of the most amazing things that has come out of Latin America in my perspective it's a beautiful writing genre that it for me it pretty much explains life Magical realism are books that tell stories with actual facts or actual places that exist in this reality, but it's also touching base with magic and fantasy, um, not in the Harry Potter way, but in a way more subtle, like 
you have to read it to understand it. It's just beautiful. I love that magical realism exists. The next book that I read was this one here called Espiritualidad Indígena y Mundo Occidental, Foros Internacionales. I translated the title in English, so it would be called Indigenous Spirituality and Western World. So this book is a compilation from the 8th Forum of Indigenous and Spirituality. This is a gathering of indigenous leaders from around the world on addiction and culture. And what I loved about this book is that it has over 30 different symposiums. This book has over 30 presentations. Each of them touches base on a different topic related to medicinal plants, related to ritual, related to indigenous knowledge, and it's bridge with the Western world. It's such a beautiful read. It's in Spanish and I got it at Takiwasi, which is one of the healing centers located in Tarapoto, uh, where my family is from. And this year in 2015, which is the forum that I read, the book is from the forum from 2015. Um, this year, the forum was held in Tarapoto. It changes locations every time that it happens. And it's such a beautiful doorway to learn more about indigenous practices. And I think that the most beautiful way to learn about indigenous practices are from the indigenous leaders themselves. So if this is up your alley and you know Spanish, this is an amazing, beautiful read. And if you don't know Spanish, check out Takiwasi. They might even have a version in English. I just didn't pick it up because you know why. My next read was a book that I read when I was very, very young as a child. And I believe mostly everyone in Peru read in their childhood, at least from my generation. And it's Mi Planta de Naranja Lima. And it's Mi Planta de Naranja Lima by Jose Mauro de Vasconcelos. I had forgotten everything about this book. I knew I read it as a child, but I'm so glad I reread it this year. This book tells the story of Cece, who is a five year old in Brazil, who is very ima imaginative. He's a rascal and he's also very poor and tells the story of Cece moving with his family due to necessities and not being able to afford rent where they were living. And Cece meets this beautiful plant. The name of the book in English would be My Plant of Orange Lime. And Cece meets an orange lime plant and they become friends and they become intimate friends. And Cece shares all of his life's um, sorrows and happiness with this plant. And this book is all about love, all about to say, all about relationships and being a kid looking for a safe space to call home. It's, <laughs> it's such a beautiful read and get ready to cry. <laughs> the next book that I read was my favorite book of the year, Agua Viva by Clarice Lispector. And it's probably one of my favorite books of all time. Top 10, maybe top five. I had never read Clarice Lispector and her way of writing just knocked me off my feet and made me fall in love with life, with love, with her, with all of it at the same time. I think this may be something a little weird to say, but it's the only words that I can find. I feel that Agua Viva is a book that speaks about the unspoken. It's a book that speaks about the mystery of being alive. It speaks about the visceral sensations that we have when we are in love with the beauty of the world, with anger, with separation, with connectivity. And it's, it's a poem. It's a, I don't even have words. For me, Agua Viva is ineffable. It's a book that I cannot even describe and I think it's just a book about humanness, about being alive in planet Earth. And, you know, if 
you are into the abstract, into the mystery, into the unknown, and also very much rooted in your humanness. Agua Viva by Clarice Lispector is the book for you. I loved it and I cannot wait to read more about Clarice. I actually, our friend, one of our friends dropped a compilation of all of her short stories, which I cannot wait to read this year. So tiny, yet so powerful. I feel I could read this book a thousand times and never get bored of it. It's hands down my favorite read of 2022. The next book that I read was The Electricity of Every Living Thing by Catherine May. This book is the story of Catherine, of the author, and Catherine is about to have a birthday. For her birthday, she decides she wants to make this very long walk. And throughout the book, you read Catherine's story of walking this hike and doing this journey, which means a lot to her because it's a challenging path. It's a challenging walk. But at the same time, Catherine has just come to realize and something has, some things have been brought to her attention that make her evaluate the fact that she may be autistic. And she is writing these both journeys at the same time. The journey of realizing her autism while she's in this journey of realizing she has the capability of walk this walk and how all of her emotions and how all of her um, way of seeing life may be different now that all this new information has come to terms for her. I read this one as an audiobook and I loved the theme. I do think that it was kind of triggering for me because there's a lot of things within myself that were being brought up, um, maybe in a time where I wasn't ready to look at them. So I loved the theme of this book. I loved that it was challenging for me to read but I also had to put it down and not listen to it for some weeks and then be like, all right, now I'm ready. So then I would continue with it. Um, and I read this book because another book by Catherine was recommended to me by a friend, Winterized or Winterizing. But I saw this title and I saw the picture on the book and this one just caught my eye. And I thought it's been beautiful for me to read it because I know there's some deep things that I will go to and start looking into after reading Catherine's book. So even though it was challenging, I'm very grateful that it came to me. Then we go back to Isabel Allende. The next book that I read was La Casa de los Espíritus, The House of Spirits by Isabel, which I had never read. And this is my mom's favorite book. It's also one of my sister's favorite book and I had never read it. This is the book that um, shoot Isabel to fame. It's her first novel. This book is the story of three generations, a family through three generations, and they are land stewards in Chile. And this book is my second favorite book of the year. It's, I couldn't put it down. I read before bed and I would just, go to bed early so I could just read longer and some nights I stayed up until 2 a.m. which is very late for me so I couldn't put down La Casa de los Espíritus if you want to get into magical realism or if you like it and you've never read this one this is magical realism at its finest and oh my god the way that Isabel narrates the stories like I feel each character is my best friend I love how she develops characters and I specifically love how she develops her female characters it's just I don't know why it just it makes me feel like all of them are my sisters it's oh my god it's this book it's I'm sorry I don't have words the next book that I read was also one of my favorites. Here we're going in the section of my favorite reads of 2022. And this book is When We Were Sisters by Fatima Ashgar. And in this story, Fatima narrates the story of three siblings that are left orphaned after their parents die. One uncle 
um, takes the custody for them and rents a home for them, but they are pretty much just left there with groceries. He just comes and drops groceries and then they are left to take care of each other, to learn how to grow up by themselves. And it's a story of these three South Asian siblings growing up in the suburbs of New Jersey and learning, you know, um, about growing up, about changing from being a child to middle, being a teenager to then leaving their teens all by themselves. All of the um, taus that have been installed by the family and just the idea of we are here together, the three of us, but at the same time, we are all alone. And it's a very intense book. It's very poetic and it's one of my favorite reads of the year as well. I love the way that Fatima approaches the story and it feels like you are living the story with them. It's so personal, it's so intimate and it it's so raw. I love how the characters are developed and I loved how deep you understand what each of them is going through at the same time, living under the same roof, learning how to take care of each other while being child. It's a beautiful read and I truly recommend it. The next book that I read is Four Treasures of the Sky by Jenny Dingui Shang. And this was also one of my favorite books of the year. This book tells the story of Taiyu, who is this small child in China who has a lot of adversity in her life and she needs to move by herself to another town. And when she does, she is kidnapped and Andayu is trafficked from China to the United States to be sold and then to work as a prostitute. And she is 14 when she arrives to the States. And this book is full of Poetry is full of magical realism. The story of Dayu is very personal, very deep, very intense. Um, and I loved learning that a lot of the facts that Jenny, the author, used for this book, like how is Dayu trafficked from China to the States, are actual facts and actual ways in the ones that a lot of Chinese girls were trafficked in the 80s to different parts of the States in the book specifically San Francisco, but it's a beautiful eye-opener to what happens. It's so fucked up that happens in this world um, and no one is looking and no one can know. So it's a very, very intense book, but it's one of my favorite reads of the year. And not only everything that Dayu goes through her life, but the way that Dayu narrates the story is so personal and it's so sincere and I I just feel Dayu is my friend, you know? It's, it's such a deep connection with Dayu and I couldn't recommend this book enough. The next book that I read was Marron Brown by Rocio Guillaguaman and this book is a memoir, is Rocio's story and Rocio shares her story from um, growing up in a human settlement in Lima, Peru up until she is 10 years old when she and her family moved to Spain and this book I love I not only love how Rocio illustrates she is an illustrator I loved learning about her writing and how she tells her own story for me this book was so relatable in a lot of ways, not only because we are the same generation and we grew up listening to the same songs and feeling the same feelings, me being someone who also left home, even though I didn't leave it at the age of 10, you know, living in another country, there's a lot of things that really made me feel like this book was home. I felt that I found a lot of, um, I could see a lot of myself within her words and this really brought a lot of healing to me. I feel this book is a beautiful um, invitation and eye-opener if you ever want to feel how it feels to or if you ever have been on the shoes of someone who has been 
a migrant, of someone who has been otherized and someone who has been racialized. And this just made me have such a more deep and profound respect for Rocio's work. It's such a beautiful book. It's in Spanish. I'm not sure if there's any translation in English, but I, I just wanted to really thank Rocio for putting this book together from such a sincere place because it's... Whew, I did thank Rocio. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. And at the same time that I was reading Marron, I was reading The Body Keeps the Score, Brain, Mind and Body in the Healing of Trauma by Bessel van der Kolk. Bessel van der Kolk is a world-known psychiatrist, researcher, professor, traumatologist, and this book is an amazing compilation of the stories of his patients' success in overcoming PTSD of different sorts with different techniques that the author explores throughout his journey as a psychiatrist and traumatologist and I thought this book, just by the title and the Monet picture, I sometimes don't do a lot of research and if something caught my eye like this one did, I just grab it. This was a hand-me-down from my friend Romani and it really caught my attention. So just by the name, I thought it would be a little bit more spiritual and emotional and I came up with a great surprise in the best way possible that it's very towards the theory and the research behind trauma, behind change, behind, like it literally has maps of, you know, brains and EMRs and different stuff to show how is the process of trauma affecting um, a person's body. And, and, you know, there's literal images, graphics and different sorts of information about the brain and how trauma changes the brain and it was very heady in a very good way but you know also going into trauma it was one of those books that I if you want to read it and feel the call to put pauses to it it's a chunky one and I feel that it did take me a time to go through all of it I loved this book I loved how knowledgeable it was and how much information it shares with you and you know if there's anything within you that you feel might um you still want to you feel you've only scratched the surface and know there's way more to go within then this is a great book but also one to you know take at your pace take it slow it'll all be good um i really really loved it and my last read of 2022 was acid for the children by red hot chili peppers bass player flea um, Michael Peter Balsari, and this book is an autobiography of Flea's life from being born, and it finishes when he starts playing at what is now Red Hot Chili Peppers. So it's his story before success. It's such a beautiful book. This was recommended by my friend Vanessa, and I'm so glad she recommended it because you know, Flea's story was full of challenges and he just shares very intimately and very openly everything that he went through from being a child, leaving Australia, going to New York and having a very stable home to then going to LA and pretty much be left at his own chance. Um, it's a book about resilience. It's a book about creativity. It's a book about... Um, finding yourself along the way and losing yourself along the way and it's just such a beautiful read regarding all things humanness creativity music drugs um a healing journey spirituality and that deep feeling that we all feel when things are made with real good intention it's a book about friendship it's a book about endurance and I loved it. This year has really been the year that I learned that I love reading autobiographies and learning about other people's lives. I truly feel that e either on someone's personal story or a novel, I feel there's just so much healing, so much inspiration to learn from other people's stories. I feel that stories are medicine, either 
imaginative stories or real person stories they all carry so much medicine and so much knowledge and i have a deep down reverence for books it's we can live so many lives just by reading and that really just like lights up my heart and lights up my fire. I hope that some of these books were inspiring to you. Let me know if you end up reading or if you have read any of these. Also, if you have any book recommendations, please share them with me. Um, I gifted myself for Christmas five books to start reading in 2023. On my Patreon, we do live calls once a month and once every four months, it's a book club. It's not that we're all reading the same book, but we all pretty much show and tell what book we're currently reading and loving. And from those five books that I just bought for myself, three of them were recommendations from my Patreons, which I cannot wait to start. And let me know if you like this. So maybe next year I can do one as well. And I'll share those five books there, of course. Anyhow, I hope this video is not that long. I'm crossing fingers. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you're having a beautiful start to your year. I will see you soon. Bye.